Newbar out of the backfield in motion to the right. Matson quarterback draw five, and he's into the end zone. Maddox Matson twice calls his own number on quarterback draws, and he's into the end zone with 42 seconds left. It's 27 to 13. Green sets up a quarterback draw, runs in the middle, dodges tacklers, he scores, and this game is tied at 27 on the 11 yard scamper from Taylor Green. Green under center, Green with the ball, throws it out, right flat, caught Riley Smith, the captain is into the end zone for the touchdown, and Boise State leads it 34 27. What a wild game last Saturday at Albertson Stadium in front of a capacity plus crowd. Boise State rallies back from a 27 7 deficit to beat San Jose State. Shane, uh, first off, good morning. Welcome. Uh, this is Jay Sports Bar. I'm your host, Jay Tuss. He is Shane Williams Rhodes, the legendary Boise State wide receiver. What was going through your mind when San Jose State, of all programs in the Mountain West, Rolled into the blue and built a 27-7 lead. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind was, here we go again. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we looked really bad. Obviously, we just were shooting ourselves in the foot. But we got, I think when we finally got it to 27-14, uh, I want to say I looked over to someone and said, we're going to win this game. 30-34. Mm-hmm. to 34, and, That's pretty darn close. Yeah. And we ended up, you know. Not let them score again, so yeah. I appreciate that. But I figured they'd get at least a field goal in the second half. Nothing. The defense pitch is a shutout. Yeah. Apparently, the dual quarterback system works for now. We're going to get into both of those and how sustainable they are. Um, I'm not, Shane. I feel like we are. We're not over. We don't overreact here on Jay Sports Bar. We justify the means. I think through whether it be knowledge or stats or in your case experience and. Uh, I will say this. I was ready to hit the panic button at 27 to 7. I was standing in the north end zone looking up at the massive new scoreboard, and uh, Boise State was just about to get the ball back, but I, I couldn't help but think, like, this, uh, this, is a, uh, this could be a turning point in the program. I mean, 27 to 7, you're 2 and 3 on the year. You're trailing a team that you have never lost to during the regular season before. Perfect 14 and 0 going into that game against San Jose State. And. You trail by 20, and you look at the sidelines, man. There was, like, zero life. I don't love being critical, but I was worried. Like, I didn't know how they were going to get up off the mat after that. I'm glad you could see what was going on inside because I was outside, you know, uh, tailgating, and I could see the fans starting to get the pitchforks. It was – they were – it was not – there was not a happy side out there. The pendulum swung so much uh, when it comes to the range of emotions in that game, and – in all honesty, maybe even for the future of the program, if if Boise State gets blown out by San Jose State by 20 on the blue, I don't really think it's an overreaction to say that ch- the changes probably would be imminent. Yeah. I mean, that because I don't know how you would have hope of beating Air Force or Fresno State or ha- even Wyoming on the blue here in a few weeks. Like, if San Jose State comes and does that to you, then I think it's in everybody's rightful mind to hit the panic button. Either way. Boise State finds a way to come back and win that thing. They pitch a second-half shutout. Of all the things that happened in that game, Shane, even getting down 27-7 to to San Jose State, seeing how this defense has played this year, the second-half shutout may be the most surprising thing that happened on Saturday inside Albertson Stadium. San Jose State has to convert a fourth and 10 at the 37. Blitz again. Cordero scampers away, almost sacked, comes to the line, and he's going to be tackled. Game, set, match. Boise State on the sack. Yeah, I got to agree. The defense for a half, we got to see a defense that we've been seeing, you know, in the past. And Mm -hmm. it was good because where we were, in order to make that comeback, we needed the defense to hold them to no points in order for us to get that one. So You could feel it, the momentum starting to shift. So right before halftime, Boise State scores that touchdown. I'm going to actually start here with the most underrated play of that entire ball game, And it involves a guy I'm going to call local legend. Fourth and uh, six, Boise State's on the 44-yard line. They're down by 20 with just a couple minutes to go in the first half to San Jose State. And Andy Avila says, we're going to go for it. And with his backup quarterback in, in Maddox Madsen, he checks it down to his 
in all honesty, third or fourth string running back. Number one in your hearts, though. Oh, yeah. And Tyler Crow catches it two yards short of the line of scrimmage. And if you have ever followed Tyler Crow's career, whether it be college or in the, at the high school level, mm-hmm. T. Crow ain't getting stopped two yards short of anything. Madsen over the middle. Ball caught by Crow. Crow fighting for the first down. I think he got it. Second effort by Tyler Crow moves the sticks and gets the first down. They threw to him short of the line, and that was all effort by Tyler Crow to get the first down. And that was the underrated play in the game that really sparked the comeback. No, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, obviously, knowing Tyler personally, mm-hmm. uh, watching him in high school, the kid was an absolute monster. Yep. And so, yeah, that was – once he got the ball in his hand, just, you knew he was going to finish the play. Mm-hmm. And it was it was good to see, you know, him finally get a shot with him being hurt and all the injuries in that running back room and him being a walk-on, the earning the scholarship, and just going through the whole process of uh, just through the program to finally see him get his shot to make a play. These moments can often be overlooked, but we're not going to let this one be overlooked. So – this week, I asked Andy Avalos about the significance of Crow, uh, Tyler Crow's energy, that he was the one that not only the play helped spark him, but his passion helped spark that team in the comeback. And also, Bush Hamden followed up with explaining just how big that play was. Take a listen. So many plays in that game, right, that, that could have been deciding factors. And, and, Jay, that is one that was a big-time play by both those guys. Um, again, that is what Maddox brings to the table, just his ability, uh, if you will, to be one step ahead of the read. Uh, that was probably – Crow was probably his fourth progression on that play. They were extremely soft. He made a quick decision to throw the outlet. And, uh, again, for Crow to recognize the situation – have the awareness of where he caught it, which was probably at four yards, and the urgency for him to push forward. Again, that's the type of play that allows us to to get that second touchdown and, and close the gap, and uh, is critical. So pretty much anybody that knows Tyler Crow, that's the Tyler Crow they know. Again, he wasn't going to be stopped, yeah. and he's a guy that you can rely on for his energy. You know, you look at a guy like Ashton Genty, who's going to get 25, 30 touches a game. Tyler Crow was lucky to get one to three and he found a way to help change the game with his one to three touches. Yeah, I mean, it just goes back to it, man. We're our team is, you know, how they always say, you know, running back by committee. Mm-hmm. Our team is a committee. We're quarterback by committee right now. We're running back by committee. I mean, obviously, you have the best running back in the country, uh, future Doak Walker Award winner. But uh, we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, we're just a committee, man. The re- even the receiver group, outside of you know the number one option, you never know who's going to show up. So it's good to see guys kind of filling those roles each week. I was going to attempt to start with defense, but I already shifted it to offense with the Tyler Crow talk. So we will come back to the defense and move to the offense. When it comes to this dual quarterback setup, I would say the thing for me that makes it feel a little different from the, the previous times that Boise State has used a two-quarterback system. When Brett Rippon was the number one quarterback here, he was on the field for a vast majority of the plays, and then Montel Cozart would come in for a drive yeah. or a specific package. It was more complimentary to the starting quarterback. And now it doesn't, at least last Saturday, it didn't feel like either one was going to be leaned on. Now, Andy Avalos said that Taylor is the starter and will remain the focal point. But with the way the game went against, once against San Jose State getting down 20, we saw how quickly that can go out the window. Yeah. So what do you think of this two-quarterback setup and the way that it played out on Saturday? I mean, I get, you know, you had to run with Madsen more because now you got to throw the ball more. You're, you're playing catch-up at this point. But as we saw, when you get Taylor involved in the run game, the run game gets a lot more successful. Mm-hmm. Things start popping. It helps Genty break. It helps everybody. I mean – it seemed to me this game we finally used Taylor how he's supposed to be used. Yeah. And then when we weren't going to use him that way, we just took him off the field and then let Matson come in and do the other things. But I just don't know how sustainable that is because at that point you come predictable. Mm-hmm. And so obviously it was a tougher for San Jose because it's harder to prep when you've prepped hearing all week that Taylor Green is a starter. So they probably focused on Taylor Green. Right. You know, so it's they, get, they had a lot of stuff thrown at them in one half. I mean – you got Gen T busting for 68. You got Taylor on broken plays where they should be he should be tackling the backfield, scoring touchdowns. You got you got like it's a lot going on right now. So it's a lot to prep for. Yeah. So I don't know how sustainable it is because obviously it just basically defense defensive teams are just gonna come in and have two game plans. When Taylor's on the field, we're gonna do this. When this guy's on the field, we're gonna do this. And since you're not using Taylor in any other way other than his strengths when he's on the field. 
it can kind of backfire. You know, inside the building over there, they kind of talk about how having opposing teams uh, prepare for two quarterbacks, they feel like is a competitive advantage. I don't know what else they would say at this point because you, you have to be positive with this, right? I mean, yeah. let's be honest, right? I mean, it's not like they're they're going to, you know, mm -hmm. try to cause chaos here or act like it's worse than it is. They're, they want to find the, the positives and build momentum. Now, that, that being said, too, like if the defense is preparing to face two quarterbacks, your offense is also having to prepare to use two quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that puts a lot more pressure on Bush Ham than make sure that he always has the right personnel on the field in the right situation, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, I, I just feel like it puts more on Bush to make sure that everything's lined up on every single play so they can p potentially execute. It does, but I think the best way to go about this, if we're going to do the two-quarterback system, I think both quarterbacks need to be able to do both. And, I mean, we saw, you know, Madison Maddox had, did, he had eight carries in the game. Yeah, for 40 yards. He's running – he ran just as much as Taylor did. Mm -hmm. I mean, Taylor had five for 40, and he had eight for 40, so – I think both quarterbacks need to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. That way, when they're on the field, you still don't know what you're going to actually get. Right. And that's why I think yeah, – I brought up Bush Hamden. I don't know if he's getting enough credit right now. I, I think Bush is phenomenal at what he does. I think as soon as they kind of have a little more stability at the quarterback position and some growth at the quarterback position, you're going to see this offense evolve and take yet another step. But he puts up 500 – his offense puts up 519 yards against Memphis, comes back here, puts up 491 against San Jose State, and they needed every single one of those yards. He's getting two quarterbacks ready to play. He has the number one running back in the country when it comes to yards from scrimmage. He has the number one wide receiver in the country when it comes to receiving – or in the, the Mountain West when it comes to receiving yards. I mean, what, what he is doing right now on offense I, I think is, is really impressive. And there's, there's just so much going on. I, I just think it's, like, hard to actually acknowledge that or focus on that. But I, I think Bush is – doing a good job all things considered i agree when you actually look at it we've lost games yes but we're scoring points finally like, like it's not like we're losing games 12 to 60 or yeah. you know we're scoring 10 we're we're in the 30s like we're scoring points and losing games it is the first boise state has scored at least 30 points in four straight games the last time that happened was 2019 uh, with 35 points against San Jose State, they are knocking on the door of 30 points per game for an average on the season. I believe they're at 29.7. The last time they averaged 30 points a game uh, for a whole season was in 2020, which was Brian Harson's last year here at Boise State. So they are definitely trending back in the right direction offensively, despite the fact it's not perfect right now. Yeah, I mean, we're averaging almost 30 points with every week not knowing who our starting quarterback is. <laughs> and we just, you know, we're just, like you said, we're flying by the seat of our hands. Thank goodness there's so much stability around the rest of the offense. I think a big part of this, though, is you definitely have to worry about Taylon Green and his confidence and his mental uh, approach right now. Because he is still a relatively young kid. He has been told that he is the present and the future of this program. Everybody has complimented his insane athletic ability. And now you're taking him off the field to put a guy that is – I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't want this to sound like I'm talking down to him because he's a great kid and he's, he's obviously proven a lot, but you're going from your 6'6", your six, six God-given ability to a kid that's 5'9", that has just made the most of every opportunity in his career in Maddox Madsen. And I, I just think whenever you take a guy like Taylor off the field, you, bet, you better be checking on how he, he is and making sure that he still has that confidence. I agree, but just watching uh, mannerisms and stuff, you know, on the sideline, mm -hmm. uh, even them getting excited, like he's getting as excited as he is when Maddox yep. is scoring, as he is when the running backs are scoring, and he's still in the end zone dancing with everyone, and it seems like he's still out there having fun. So that would be something kind of that typically you see when, you know, the other quarterback scores and he's on, and the other one's on the sideline pouting mm -hmm. or kind of just, you know, has that demeanor about him. So I think they're, they're doing it well right now. I was a little worried early in that game because uh, I don't I don't think Taylor you know those first couple series I don't think he did look his like normal self like he is the first guy to kind of like dance or smile or um, hype up a teammate or thing things like that and I didn't really see that early but then you're right like once it kind of got into the second quarter and especially the second half he he brought that energy he brought that attitude and I think the turning point for me when it came to Taylor's game was how he was running. And when you're the starting quarterback and you're being told to make sure that you're safe and you don't get hurt and all these things, you slide quite a bit, right? Yep. 
Taylor didn't slide very – I don't even know if he slid at all against yeah. San Jose State. He was taking dudes on. At that point, Taylor Green to me looked like he was playing a little pissed off. Yep. Uh, when you have to share those – In a good way, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's just like when you're playing running back. If you're sharing carries, you got to make sure every carry you are just going balls to the wall. Yeah. And that's what he was doing. He was – you know, basically putting a stamp on it, like, I should be on the field. Mm-hmm. I should be, you know, showcasing what I have. Because as we saw, even on broken down plays, when guys go the wrong way, he makes them right. Yeah, he has, like, this ability to stick his foot in the ground. And even though he is so long levered, he can still make guys miss. And it's just mm-hmm. it's just even for that second where he can freeze them, and he's so quick, he's gone, you yeah. know. And we saw that on his touchdown run, mm-hmm. um, which was another great play. I don't know how many guys – in the Mountain Western college football at that position, you know, can make that play. He is one of them. It's not many for sure. So when it comes to whether it be his performance, his response to the circumstances, um, his overall outlook on what's going on right now, we asked Bush Hamden about this this week. And Bush said that, you know, when it came to Talon in all those areas, he loved what he saw last week. I just cannot say enough about what he kind of went through that week there was a span, I think it was over an hour long, where he didn't touch the football in that game, right? Looking at the fourth quarter, or excuse me, the second quarter coming into halftime, uh, for for him to come in there and play the way he played to support the other guy uh, just speaks volumes to him, and I mean that. Uh, he's uh, I'm as proud of any guy I've worked with as, as that guy to be in the pressure environment he's in, uh, to be in a situation where – uh, certainly with the media and all that, to have handled himself as professionally as he did and, and went out and executed like that. Again, we need both those guys to win that game. So obviously some some nice words there from Bush Hamden um, for, you know, towards Taylor Green. But you also have, we, we also talked to Taylor Green this week, so I want, I want to check in with him. We're going to hear from him in just a second. How do you have to paint this picture, Shane, so that the outside world sees it one way, but you know, like inside the building and, and inside a player's heart, the, the it feels differently. You kind of have to stand up there and say the right things, right? Yep. I mean, and I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth or paraphrase for anybody. And honestly, if this didn't make you a little bit agitated or, or a little uncomfortable, I would question you. Like yeah. that. That's when I would question you. Agreed, but you know, like they say, perception is reality. So. He has to give the perception that he is the, the starting quarterback and, you know, he's doing what's best for the team and all these things. Whether he feels that he should be on the field the whole time, he has to – you got to give the perception. All right. Well, if perception is reality, then I guess we're going to live in the reality. Here's Taylor Green on how he was informed Boise State will start using this two-quarterback uh, system and uh, how he feels about it. They told me uh, in a meeting, you know, just what I have and – Bush and um, like I said, you know, just doing what I got to do for the team, you know, to get the to get these wins, especially in conference play, and um, you know, just a two quarterback system. Just it's new. We're going through ironing out the rinks and the uh, doing all that. So you know, it's just each week, just learning from what we did last week. Uh, I feel like you know the confidence comes from you know your prep, and confidence comes from you know within and. Um, just knowing who you are as a person, you know, and um, I feel like at a confidence level, my confidence is still high and I still have confidence in my teammates. They still have it in me. Um, but um, I have to put the emphasis on each opportunity I have in there, you know, just doing my best. And like when I'm off the field um, and when Maddox is on the field, you know, just still got to be locked in and uh, likewise with him. So we definitely have to be intentional and we definitely have to be really Um, detailed in uh, what we do, especially when we're transitioning because, you know, the play clock and all that. And just um, when he's in, I can't skip a beat. I mean, he can't skip a beat. When I'm in, I can't skip a beat. So just um, doing that, doing those type of things. He's a leader of this team. I think he said the right things right there. Winning is is more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. I still think that Taylor Green is the future of this team. And I think that there were some things that happened within the game that showed me he, he did have some growth in this game. I asked Bush Hamden about, you know, sometimes there's less more, you know, yeah. when you're not having to worry about 67 plays and you're only worrying about 32. And by the way, that was the split. Taylor was on the field for 32. Maddox Matson was on the field for 35 plays. Now, all of a sudden, your focus, you can really start to get some tunnel vision when you're on the field about what you have to do. Mm-hmm. And I know some of the things that they like about um, Maddox Matson is, is his ability to anticipate throws 
and his ability to read defenses and and check it down when when that's the when that is the option and not make mm-hmm. matters worse, right? Yeah. And he he checks it down. Tyler Crow, we mentioned it earlier, gets gets you know the, the a very pivotal first down. Uh, we saw him do it against Memphis with Ashton Genty. Checks it down to Ashton Genty. Ashton turns it into a 15-yard touchdown. They nearly, you know, they, that helps them try to come back against Memphis. So against, ironically, it all, this play also involves Tyler Crow. Second half, not you know, right before the fourth down conversion, Taylor Green gets gets a call where he's looking downfield. It's not there. He immediately finds Tyler Crow for an 11-yard gain and a first down. And so. Uh, those are the things that I think are really encouraging that when, when we look at Taylor Green's game and, and see, like, maybe less is more right now. His shot mm-hmm. play to Eric McAllister, his footwork was beautiful. Yeah. Like, these are, like, the little things for Taylor to, like, really make that next jump. He's got to achieve on a consistent 67-play type basis. But when you cut it in half, now all of a sudden you can really have that tunnel vision, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you can see that. Both quarterbacks, you know, are getting better. But when you look at the negatives of both, you got to see that. We are obviously know having Maddox in there. He's going to force some balls sometime because he believes in his arm. You can tell he believes mm-hmm. in his arm. And then you, when Taylor's in, it's good to see him now taking the check downs because before, you know, the system they started doing the two quarterback system. Taylor was holding the ball and then just escaping. Mm-hmm. So now he's still trying to find and going through the full progression of you know, the one, the two, the three, and then the check down, right? So and to then see you him do that instead of escape. You know, usually you want to escape after you check your check down. Right. You know, so then you don't have to. But it's it's good to see the growth of both, and I think they're going in the right direction. Uh, it's you know, it's kind of weird when you have to do it two quarterbacks at a time, but it's it's obviously we can see the development is, is coming in. One other thing that I wanted to ask you about um, is the lack of a senior or an upperclassman in that quarterback room. And I thought of this while I was driving to work on Saturday before the game, and I was like, oh, I'm going to ask Shane about this. Because I do think that that is something that we can overlook, and I do think that there's a significant mm-hmm. impact on that. I think it's going to be hard to achieve in the current climate of college football because if you do have – an upperclassman at quarterback, it's going to be very hard to recruit a young and talented quarterback that wants to play early in his career. I think that's just going to be the challenges you face right now with the freedom of the transfer portal. Because even if you do get him here and he's like, I don't want to wait two more years to start, I'm going to hit the transfer portal and go somewhere else and play. Yeah. Um, but you look back and, I mean, you played with Grant Hedrick. He, he became the most accurate passer in the history of, of the Boise State football program. Yes, more accurate than Kellen Moore. He, he set the career completion percentage record over Kellen Moore, right? But I bring up Kellen because Grant got to sit in that quarterback room and just marinate for years watching Kellen Moore do what he did. Kellen Moore had some guy named Bush Hamden that he got to see how it was done, right? Yep. And right now you literally don't have anybody that's older than a sophomore in that quarterback room. And – you know, this week I, I asked Bush Hamden about it, and he brought up, you know, Colt Fulton. But, he, again, Colt's a uh, – he played at a great high school. He had a lot of success. I feel bad for him because he, he was one of those COVID seniors that mm-hmm. either, you, you know, you didn't get to play, there wasn't a lot of tape on you, and so it's really hard to get recruited at that point. But he's obviously a, a kid that's, you know, gifted between the ears, and uh, he really helps out the Boise State football program. And he's not talked a lot about and, and Bush Hamden, you know, freely brought up Colt Fulton. But still, though, there is not anybody that has legit college experience that is yeah. a junior, senior, has been in a program for four, five, six years now um, yeah. that, that can help kind of these younger guys. Yeah, and that's tough because, like you said, even like Grant, Grant was able to literally go in the game, pull Kellen out, run a few plays, and come back out, mm-hmm. and then Kellen goes back in. So, like, he actually got to play with Kellen. He got to learn from him for two years in the, in the quarterback room. Uh, I mean, you go down the list. You had Finley who got to watch Grant, and then you got, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Finley did a year, and then while Finley was doing that year, you had uh, you had Brett. Mm-hmm. Brett got to learn from him. And yeah. As it goes there, and goes and goes. There's just always – there has almost always been just that mm-hmm. older presence. And, and whether they have had success on the field or not, I think that it adds value 
to that quarterback room. And for sure, it, I, I just think it's different at times when you hear stuff from your coach and when you hear from somebody that is similar in age to you that you respect because he has a little more experience than you and can really relate to you, whether it be, fo- be in football or in life. And I, I just I, I think there is absolutely something to that right now as this young quarterback room tries to grow up in a hurry. I think the biggest part about it, too, is not all, but most of football players, just in general, we're visual learners. Mm-hmm. So, like, which is why when we you do plays and you install plays, we literally walk through installs. Like, this is where you go. We walk through it. You do it. Uh, they show you it, what it's supposed to look like on film. Then you go walk through it, and then now you do it in practice. Yeah, it's like we're visual learners. So to not have an older guy to go out there and literally watch and learn from, it's kind of it's kind of tough, you know, because yeah. basically you're learning. Not, I mean, necessarily on the fly because you didn't get to see anyone else do it. Mm-hmm. So when you got here, who was that guy for you? And and you know, I, I mean, I don't want to suggest it's Matt Miller, but you still like he 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 played a different position, but still like. Matt Miller is that guy that checked all the boxes, film study, preparation, taking care of his body, working out, mm-hmm. uh, being extremely tough as he had a number of injuries that nobody ever even knew about because he just pushed right on through playing with them all the time. Um, but I think it's different because that also brings out the competitive desire and, and fire in you, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're all competitors and you can say that you want your teammates to be great and all this stuff and I totally get that. But if you're not pushed by your teammates, then again, I'm going to question what is wrong with you. If you see him there, I'm like, well, damn, how can I show up? I don't care if it's one minute before he does. How can I be there to greet him when he walks in the door? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's different. And it's just different when it's a coach and a player. It's true. Uh, the guy for me, so obviously Matt, yes. Matt was uh, basically a mentor, a really good mentor for me because I would play with him for three years. Yeah, you got you got here in 12, mm-hmm. and he got here in 10. He redshirted in 10. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. The, the guy that I actually um, – because it was kind of the guy that I was brought to replace his role, mm-hmm. which a lot of people forget about this guy. I don't know how, but Chris Potter, man. Dude, I saw Chris at the game this last week. Yes. He's doing great. He looks great. Yeah, man. Chris Potter was the guy for me that I watched because, you know, I got here. He was the guy was the, the smaller guy. He did all the quick things. He was the punt, punt returner. returner. Yep. Like, so it was like, okay, Chris is a senior. You're a freshman. You're all these plays that he had. This is where we're gonna eventually fill you in at. So just kind of learn from that guy. So I got to watch someone. I didn't do punt return my first my first year. Chris was the punt returner. Him and Mitch Burrows. So I got to watch those two do it. I got to learn. I even though they had me doing punt return my freshman year, I never got to do it in a game. But in practice, like it was, those two would go, and I was the next one. So basically, Pete was. Uh, you know, getting me ready because uh, <laughs> that is a wild place to be is back there on my return. But uh, kick return, I got – obviously me and Jay just got to do that as freshmen. But, yeah, you just – I sat behind Potter and I got a few of his plays from him so I could run him. But for the most part, a lot of the vertical stuff down the field, I got to learn all that stuff from him. I got to watch how he created separation. He was technically just as small as me, if yeah. not smaller. And so – think- <laughs> Stat, like yeah, height wise, he might have had an inch on you, mm-hmm. but stature wise, yeah. he's probably a little slimmer. Yeah, so it was it was good to watch how he did things and how he went about it. So it's like how you say you get a chance to watch it visually, and so. So what was your like? You had a great story about Tank Lawrence last week. What was the story that? <laughs> yeah, give us a story about Chris Potter where you just saw something that he was doing. I don't know whether it's lifting. I don't know whether it happened in June, July, uh, January, uh, what August, whenever. Like, what what's the story that? Um, I you know, think, without him, you wouldn't have become the receiver that you were, which was a receiver that played as a true freshman. The I think the biggest tip that I took away from Chris was Chris was not okay. No disrespect here, uh, Potter. Uh, Chris wasn't fast, but he was smart and he was quick. Yeah. And so watching him, how he ran his routes, and it was what he did is he used a lot of tempo because he wasn't super super fast. Mm-hmm. What he did is he would tempo his routes sometimes to go maybe 75%. And so he's running, and you're just trying to stay with him. And then he would just Boom. hit 100, like, now. And then he did it at the top of the routes or, you know, halfway through. So now he's gotten you to slow your feet down, and then he takes off, and now he's created separation from him changing speed, and now you have to react. And then you're reacting, and now he's changing direction. And 
he was really good at route running. And this is what I mean. This is like, you know, f- of being a visual learner as a mm-hmm. player. Yeah. When you're standing behind him, you know, whether it be in uh, PRPs during the off season, yep. fall camp, or, or in a game or in practice, and you're kind of looking at him all of a sudden do what you want to do, and you're like, huh, yeah. okay, I get this now. And that's why I just think that there's something that, that I think that applies in some way, shape, or form to this quarterback room. I think they're tremendously talented, but they are just a little young right now, and that, that just it just is what it is. And due to the circumstances, they don't have that older presence in the locker room, yeah. uh, in the quarterback room. That can give them these little tips that, that that just make you know help advance them. The coaches do a great job. That's, this is like a separate conversation from all that. There's just these little things we, we hear about being a player driven program or a player led program. These are the little things that I think that you know really matter. So at the end of the day, the quarterbacks. But man, what a serendipitous thing, by the way. Chris Potter came up to me after the pregame show last week. Uh, he was back here just visiting. Went to the game and. He comes up to me. He was like, "Hey, you remember me?" And I look at him. I'm like, "Holy, it's Chris." <laughs> he looks Chris. like a little kid. Doesn't he? he? Kind of, yeah. yeah. He, look, he looks awesome, it's by the way. Crazy. I wish I looked as good as him. He's, but uh, I was like, "Oh my god!" I was like, "Yeah, Chris Potter." And he's like, "Yeah, what's up?" And so we had a nice little conversation. I like to caught give up a on disclaimer life. though. Uh, CP, if we, if me and you both played nowadays, we would be considered slow. So uh, I'm glad we uh, <laughs> played when we did. Kids are now running, you know, ten ones and stuff in high school. So we made it. We made it at a good time. That's awesome, man. <laughs> I, I'm so happy that that lined up like that. Um, the quarterback, so so at the end of this thing, Talon was 4 of 8, 75 yards. That's a good yards per attempt. Um, Maddox was eleven, or excuse me, 9 of 16 for 155 yards, had a score, had a pick. Uh, they both combined a rush for 79 yards, and that was almost split exactly in half, and they combined for three rushing touchdowns. So add it all up, add it all up. 13 of 24 for 230, one touchdown throwing, one interception, and then you have uh, – excuse me, two touchdowns throwing because Taylor had a throwing touchdown to Riley Smith. And then on the ground you had 79 yards rushing for three touchdowns. That's five total touchdowns and almost 300 yards of offense amongst your – over 300 yards of offense for your quarterbacks. You take that stat line actually any day of the week. For sure. But how do – I guess football is all about, you know – controlled variables and uncontrolled variables and the problem is with having two quarterbacks is let's say Taylor just wakes up on the wrong side of the bed that next game day and one quarterback is doing really good and then the other one isn't like how it just, it just adds another uncontrolled variable and they're yeah. having two quarterbacks to lead an offense one offense that's the problem well moving forward we did ask Bush like what he learned from this last week is two better than one in his mind, it is for now, but it's not something he prefers. Take a listen. Yeah, I probably want to just have one quarterback, you know. <laughs> I just think for for that added layer, you know, it's uh, for a long time here we've been uh, so heavy on personnel groups, as you guys know, dating, dating way back and uh, – uh, sometimes going into a game with 40, 50 different personnel groups to give give guys a role, play guys their strength. It's probably the first time I've been a part of, uh, you know, even adding to that number based off your quarterback moving in and out. But um, again, it, it's a testament to both those guys, uh, the ability for them to stay locked in while they're not taking every rep and still be extremely productive. What this comes down to, Shane, they're doing what they feel like they have to do to win ball games, and, and I can't really fault them for that. You know. Because they, they got to get hot, they got to figure it out, and just like last year, when Andy Avalos made an in-season change at offensive coordinator, and a lot of people forget this, Andy Avalos was named the off- or Mountain West Coach of the Year last year. Like he got it figured out. They won ten games. They went to a bowl game. They won the bowl game. They played for the Mountain West Championship. Came up short in that, but he made a really cr- critical in- in-season decision, and it worked. And we're about to see if it happens again because yeah. this, this is another unconventional way of, of going about it. Two quarterbacks, yes, it's worked. But as you heard Bush Hamden, even, Bush Hamden even jokingly say right there, he would prefer one. One thing that helps out, two things that help out, regardless of who plays quarterback in this offense, is Ashton Genty and Eric McAllister. Ashton Genty leads all of college football with 1,010 yards from scrimmage this year. He uh, – has about a well, well over a 400 yard advantage in the Mountain West for the guy that's in second place when it comes to yards from scrimmage. Uh, the guy in second place has 596, and it's Eric McAllister. So, despite everything that's going on right now, you could very easily argue that 
Boise State has the two most talented skill position players in the Mountain West Conference. Those two are those. That's the controlled variables that I was just controlled about. variables. Those are controlled variables. We know for sure. We have a receiver that's going to show up every week, and we have a running back that's going to show up every week. What do you think of Ashton, and what do you make of his fumbles? Uh, it's part of the game. I know people don't want to hear that, but I'm, I'm right. I'm honestly, he, I'm right there with you. He carried the ball and touched the ball as much as he touches it. It, it happens. It does, and and I know that people are going to hate hearing that because they expect that uh, they want perfection and all this stuff. But when you run like Ashton, mm-hmm. and when you give Ashton the ball as many times as he is getting it. He leads the country in touches too at 145. Yeah. I mean, his his work usage or is so much higher than it was last year that he is figuring out how he has to physically recover between games, play through pain in games. Um, these are all things that he's done, you know, previously in his career, but it is at such a heightened level because of the the way that he's playing and the level he's playing at, uh, meaning the highest level of college football. That he's got to figure this stuff out and. Yeah, they can't happen. Like, I mean, like mm-hmm. we got to say that. Like, I, I get it, but it doesn't mean they're not going to happen, yeah. right? I'd be more worried if his ball security was bad. But if you look at both fumbles. Dude, the second have... one, I got a beautiful shot of it. <laughs> hat right on the football. Yeah. Like, like there are times I, I would liken a lot of stuff to baseball, Shane. <laughs> if there is a time where you're a pitcher and you throw your best slide piece at somebody and they, they hit it 400 hit feet, it. honestly, you can't even get mad. You tip your cap and you go on to the next play. Yeah. He looked mad after a second fumble, yeah. but you also kind of got to tip your cap to the defender because he did his job at a very elite level, and he got you. I mean, it's just – it happens. Like I said, it, I, he has the ball exactly where they teach you to keep the ball, and the ball is coming out. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I would – typically, you know, a guy running full speed with his and his head hits you first on the ball. It's not a lot of people who have an arm that's strong enough to hold on to that. Mm-hmm. It happens. You see it in the NFL – uh, like I said, he's. It's not like he has bad ball security. It's just you know he had some. The the ball is not rolling his way. A big reason why. Drives. A big reason why I also can quickly forget about the two fumbles is because he put up a buck eighty three, and when he came from yards from scrimmage, he didn't score a touchdown, but he set up a number of touchdowns. He is uh he is elite, and I asked I I, I mustered up the courage because I, I think like now the sample size is big enough. I asked both Andy Avalos. And Bush Hamden this week. Do you guys here at Boise State have the best running back in all of college football? And I don't, I, you know, as a coach, you know, you, I think you kind of try to find ways to compliment your running back, but also sidestep that question a little bit. And both successfully did that. Mm-hmm. You know, Bush said, man, if he's not the best, he's probably top three. I honestly don't have enough time to pay attention to everybody, you know, every elite mm-hmm. running back out there, but they certainly love having him. Uh, at their disposal. His response was uh, nothing short of remarkable. They don't win that game without Ashton Genty. He had a big 68-yard run that uh, also helped get them back into the game. And another thing when it came to – it's almost like the quarterback situation, Shane. I know coaches at times – I think that most would admit this. They get a little stubborn with fumbles, and they feel like they got to sit guys for a while to make them learn a lesson. Well, he sat the last minutes of the – the last seven minutes of the first half – but Boise State clearly knew if they were going to win that game, they needed Ash and Genty. And I don't know how many plays on offense he missed in the second half. I mean, he was there almost every single offensive play. Yeah, and I think there was another game he fumbled and they sat him yep. for a bit. North, North Dakota has two fumbles. They get down near the goal line. He's the guy that runs the wildcat package. He comes and scores a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, he, I mean, he certainly knows how to respond in mm-hmm. game. Yeah, I mean, like we said, it happens. But at the end of the day – I'm excited because I want to see what the Dope Walker, you know, trophy looks like. I've never seen one in real life, so it's going to be good to kind of bring one of those back. If Boise State stays in the thick of it for a Mountain West title race, I don't see how there's any way he's not in that conversation. I hope that the rest of the country starts to find out about him. Well, I don't know. Maybe we don't hope that because <laughs> that transfer portal is going to heat up for him this offseason. Or I, I shouldn't say requests for him are going to heat up this offseason. I will say this, though. All the fans on there that on, on social media like are suggesting like he's gone in the transfer portal. Just like chill, find a way to keep him here if anything. Yeah, let's get that GoFundMe going. Right, guys. like man, I don't, I don't, I, that doesn't help the situation. Yeah, he's gone, <laughs> but maybe. But I would yeah. be, I'd be more worried about trying to find a way to keep him here. Yeah, for sure. We got to silence that talk. Uh, Eric McAllister continues to be unbelievable. 170 receiving yards. He shows up each and every week for this Boise State football team. 
I know you want to see some other guys in that receiver room step up too, though, Shane. Yeah, I definitely would like to not have to look at the stat line and know that the running backs and the like the running backs had I think three guys that had more receiving yards and stuff than like the next two receivers. Was, right. It's after, pretty close. After Eric, you're yeah, saying it's, yes. It's pretty close. Yeah, because Ash and Genty had um had a few receiving yards. Tyler Crow did. Even uh, Breezy Dubar had a catch last week. So yeah. that uh, yeah, you're you're probably you're probably right on that. I do think that getting back to Maddox Matson really quick, I I still do like his anticipation. I do think that now that they've taken the step where they've shown that it can work, sometimes I kind of wonder now do you now do you have confidence to get a little creative? I can, I kind of mentioned this last week. I think I think at some point we see both Maddox and Taylor on the field together. I don't know when it happens. I don't know what it, what it looks like, but at some point in time, you're gonna have a little fun with it, right? Like you, it, you it's that probably, option's there. It's probably coming. Okay, probably coming. We'll so we'll coming. we'll wait and see. Who knows when? Maybe they got to figure it out during the bye week, or I don't know. It'd be it'd be fun to see it happen, though. I think it will happen on defense now. Finally, get to defense. Like I said, it was the most shocking thing of the entire game for me. The fact that Boise State, after giving up 27 in the first half. And they could not stop Chevin Cordero to save their life. I mean, they really couldn't in the first half. Uh, tackling. The f- tackling was awful. Um, they had 10 explosive plays in the first half alone. So you're talking about pass plays of 15 or more yards, rushing attempts of 10 or more yards. 10 in the first half alone. San Jose State gets two in the second half. What happened? Just watching the first half. Tackling was so bad. It was so I mean, bad. I think on one of his touchdowns, the quarterback might have broke three tackles. Yeah, it was not good. Like, and they weren't like you know, it were he was running through guys. Right through like, I'm, especially the it first looks line. like Ashton Genty yeah. going to the pylon. I was like, what is going on? And if obviously if you have a guy like that who can escape, that then changes things because now guys are a little more aggressive to come up, and mm-hmm. now we're getting hit over the head on the pass game and. Yeah, I don't know. It was it was it's just weird to see how the first half looked tackling and then how the second half cuz it's not like they went and did any tackling drills, nope. you know. Hey, I mean, how does that improve so much at halftime? And we talk about it all the time, you know. Obviously, being a coach now is we tell the kids like you got to want to tackle. If you don't want to tackle, you're not going to tackle. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think defensively they when obviously the offense started scoring a few more points and they felt like we're in this game. If we just do our job, then they'll, you know, do theirs, and, and that's what it seemed more like to me. Then, yeah, man, that was I. That's just the way that it flipped. Is just that switch was pretty crazy. Chevin Cordero, San Jose State's quarterback in the first half, eleven of sixteen for two hundred forty-two yards. That's an average of fifteen point one yards per attempt. So. Every time you put the ball in the air, explosive play. He's, yeah, it's an explosive play, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Um, three carries, thirty-two yards. Every time he ran the ball, explosive play. <laughs> yep. Right. That's true. Second half, twelve of twenty-two, twelve of twenty-two for eighty-three yards. That is three point seven yards per attempt. I in mean, the that, pass that, game in the pass game. I mean, that's yeah. that, that's hardly three yards in a cloud of dust, barely getting a first down at that point. Three carries. Negative three yards. See, look at that. His quarterback efficiency rating in the second half, 77. That's in the mud. His quarterback efficiency rating in the first half, 195. <laughs> All-American. I, the, I, I still, the, the, their ability to figure that out when they haven't really figured it out all season was remarkable. It gives me hope for the future. But now, just like we talk about the quarterback position, is it sustainable? Can they do this again this weekend in Fort Collins against Colorado State? The best thing for the defense is the last half that they've played of football, they've seen who they could be, mm-hmm. right? So they played, they struggled all year, and then now they finally put something together. Uh, and they found a way to win, I think, is the biggest thing. Because if you just rewind it to last week, we were up 17-0. to Yep. And we found a way, and we, you know, we weren't able to find a way to win after being up. And then you backdoor there this week. We were down 17-0, and we found a way to win. So, like, they're, they, like, they're starting to learn, like, there is a – like, we all work together and we all do our job, 
You know, if you're the first guy there on the quarterback and he's scrambling, you probably should make the tackle. You yep. know, it's it's the quarterback. It's not even the running back. So just everyone doing their job and finding a way to win last week, I think that is gonna they'll be able to build on that. I think that's the progression they're making here. Uh, that was – in the first half, Chevin Cordero was very comfortable in whatever he did. In the second half, he spent a lot of time patting the ball, looking downfield. Okay, time to get out of the pocket because the mm -hmm. clock in his, his head is expiring. Get out of the pocket, look down, look back up. And it just – it didn't work for, for him. And, and Boise State did a great job. Amari McCoy comes up with a big-time interception when they needed it. And Andy Avila says they're going to need Amari McCoy to continue to be a playmaker for them. Um and, you know, I, I think that, you know, they, they mixed and matched from personnel. I think that it's taken a little bit longer than anyone would like to hope uh, that it takes to, to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you have a backup, when, you, when, you, when a starter goes down at one position, maybe the best answer isn't always his backup. Maybe it's moving a guy like Andrew Simpson all of a sudden to stud, mm -hmm. and then Andrew Simpson's backup – is better than the backup of the position you're moving Andrew Simpson to, right? Yeah. And so now Andrew Simpson is is rushing the passer at stud. You have a guy behind him that's responding to, to, to play his role, and they just did a really good job of mixing and matching some pieces and achieving the result that they desperately needed, not only for you know the, the San Jose State game, but really for the rest of the season. I'm going to go back and quote something from two podcasts ago. Two episodes ago. I thought you were going to say Tupac. I was like, okay, what up? <laughs> <laughs> two episodes ago, uh, we talked about – Learn, when I was talking about learning offenses mm -hmm. and how you learn to play with, if you know what the other guy on the other side is doing, you can move to that position. But if you are a young guy and you are only learning that one position, mm -hmm. then they don't have the ability to do that. So you got to have some smart football players down there to be able to do that. I think you guys he, around. I think Andrew Simpson's a smart football player. I think that Andrew Simpson is going to be a massive star on this defense in the very near future. And uh, he was a big reason why they were able to pressure the quarterback and make Chevin Cordero uncomfortable and, and win that game. And uh, they do, they're, they're going to have to prove it again. And I think they're figuring out their personnel and where they need to put guys to succeed. I think the guys are taking, uh, have a better understanding of what it takes to prepare for a game and succeed. And getting back to just some of these like little things, you know, talking with a couple coaches, this is a high level of football. It, I mean, it is like there are things that you assume your players will know. And, and, I, and I don't even think that that's, that's not a bad thing at all. Like, I, I just think there are things that, you know, you kind of assume when you've had, a guy that's a, a senior at one spot and he leaves and you have a freshman replace him, maybe you even think you forget about some of those, the, the smallest of details. You're like, man, I got to go back and I got to teach this. I know yeah. it also gives me a better understanding now why Chris Peterson always said, you know, I want you guys to, to have the uh, idea that you're going to learn like you're a kindergartner every mm -hmm. time you go or whatever. What, what yep. was it? First grader, yep. kindergartner? Teach me like I'm a first grader. Teach me like I'm a first grader. It's not missing anything, and now I understand the value of it. But, it, I mean, even it's even simple walkthroughs, right? Like, you call out a play, this is where you're supposed to be, what are you doing? And, it, it, I mean, I think the level of detail now is like, hey, look at where, look at how your feet are positioned. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, got it. That matters. I, I, did, I did everything right, but that was like the one thing, because I'm a kid, that I, I kind of forgot, and we're going through a walkthrough, and I didn't emphasize that. Yep. That is now being emphasized once again. And on the line, that matters. That's huge. Yeah. And, yes. and, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's something, yeah, like you said, experience, it, it's it's huge. It's really, really big. Uh, I never understood, you know, for the D-lineman at least, because, you know, that I wasn't quite big enough to play on the D-line. Uh, <laughs> but I never understood, like, the footwork of it, how important it was, you know, of which foot's up, which one's back. You know, if you're – when you're in the stud position standing up and when you got your hand on the ground, just all those different things – the angles but those are the things that were are again being emphasized i think it, the, the learning now is actually transitioning from what they're doing in practice to the game we saw that in the second half and now they just need it to continue so next up for the boise state football team um this is a game that i think fans really appreciate because colorado state fans aren't the friendliest to boise state fans at times but man to the broncos have tons of bragging rights over Colorado State. When you look at this all-time series between Boise State and Colorado State, the Rams still got that goose egg in the win column. The Broncos undefeated all-time against Colorado State. They're going to try to keep it that way, and I am sure that there is going to be plenty of motivation to keep it that way, Shane. Can I just make one request? What's up? Can we not try to have the biggest comeback 
against Colorado oh, State. 2017, <laughs> one of the best games that I have ever seen. It took overtime, an onside kick prior to overtime. Uh, the Broncos, the the it was one of the biggest deficits they've ever had to overcome. Uh, this this one against San Jose State was, I, be, I believe it even edged that one out, but uh, that one felt yeah. like it was almost insurmountable the way that game started. Actually, no, that was twenty eight. That was twenty eight three. So it wasn't bigger. It's the old Super Bowl score. State. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, yeah, they, they overcame that thing. So yeah, hopefully it won't take that type of effort. I mean, I remember when I first got here and fans were always agitated that the score was forty to three at halftime and nobody really <laughs> wanted to stay for the second half. Make <laughs> us go home early, okay? <laughs> Make us go home early. It's. I think this week we got the battle of the best receiver in the Mountain West. We do, Tory Horton. Um, if he, I think we'll have to see. We think he's going to be available. Tory Horton, I mean, he is. He's the guy Boise State missed on. I know. I wish, brother, I wish the best for him. His brother played at Boise State. Tyler Horton mm-hmm. was a great cornerback. Had the 99 yard pick six at Nevada. Um, but man, it would have been nice to have. He would be. A, imagine him on this offense. You put him and Emac out there. Yeah, Ooh. that's that's a tough one. You could for, be quarterback for sure. That we missed on. <laughs> that's real tough that we missed that. Yeah, I'll, I'll be and sure. And yeah, every opportunity. By the way, I mean, Tory committed to Nevada out of high school, and then when Jay Norvell went to Colorado State, he followed Jay over there. He's an easy guy to root for because he he was a guy, from my understanding, I do not know I do not know Tory Holton uh, Horton, and I don't know people that know him, but um, I have I know people that have a very good understanding of the game, and he apparently had significant interest and it was tried you know people tried to lure him into the transfer portal and he just he likes where he's at he likes his opportunity and i i definitely admire and respect him for that because he probably could have gone off to some sec school and made boatloads of money for for this you know his final year of college football for sure i uh i actually want to reach out to tyler to see who he's rooting for this week. right you know? Got blood thicker than water, right? Yeah, yeah we'll see sometimes you're loyal to the soil <laughs> <laughs> Should be a good matchup. You you know, Colorado State made a uh, quarterback change not too long ago themselves. It's worked out for him. Turns the ball over a little bit. I made a prediction last week that Rodney Robinson was going to get a pick. He came up short of that prediction. Um, I, I still think it's coming soon. You see the frequency that Colorado State turns the ball over. Maybe it's this week. Uh, Amari McCoy did get that interception last week. There's going to be opportunities there, and uh, it's going to be up to the secondary to take advantage of those opportunities put themselves in the right spot, and then hold on to that opportunity when it is thrown directly at their chest. Uh, we'll see if that happens, but wh- wh- where are you going on this one? Uh, seven and a half points, Boise State is favored in this contest. On the road, I know it's been an up-and-down season. You know, Colorado State played Colorado unbelievably tough a few weeks ago, but we're also kind of wondering, well, is Colorado that good? And then they get blown out by Oregon, but then they play pretty well against USC, and they make it a game. But, like, so, like, who the, who is Colorado? And who is Colorado State, more importantly? Uh, do you got the over-under? I don't have the over-under, but I can look it up for you. Oh, here we uh, go. I got you. What's up? So we're okay. going to go qu- double quarterback system. We're not going to fumble the ball twice. So okay. I'm going to go 38 okay. to 28. 38-28. So they cover. Cover. Okay. I'll take that. Seven and a half. The, to- the total, actually, okay, it actually is a little bit more than I thought. Uh, the over under is 60 right now, depending on where you look 60.5, 61, but somewhere between 60 and 61. But you're so that would you'd hit the over and you'd have the cover, Boise State barely hitting the over, too, huh? With that by six, mm-hmm. yeah, I like that. I 38 28. It's maybe it's just my the fact that I've covered this team for too long and I like their ability to bounce back and I maybe I have too much confidence in them and I. I almost felt like I did last week, um, you know, but they got it done. And so I'm I'm just going to – I was the kid that I – my dad would be like, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And I'm like, well, is the stove really hot? Is it hot to you? I, be, I, I bet, <laughs> Dad, I'll be, I check this out when you're not looking. And then I got a gigantic <laughs> blister on my thumb, you know. That was that was me. So I was that kid. So it's time to touch the stove again. I say the Boise State wins. I think the Boise State covers. And they, they continue their dominance over Colorado State this weekend in Fort Collins. Over hits? Over hits. Over hits. I think I, Boise State, I think that now all of a sudden that people are, uh, even the, the Vegas betters have now dropped some of the, you know, Boise State scoring expectations. And I think the Boise State's on the upward trajectory when it comes to that. For so sure. I I actually do like the over because I think the Boise State's going to be able to move the rock and score. 
And, um, you know, it's going to be interesting. It seems like there's always something that pops up with an injury. Who's in, who's out. Uh, we'll be paying attention to the offensive line. I, I just, we've been talking about George Halani for weeks. I think that, you know, I, I, you're so close to the bye. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's almost like you sit him one more week and you get even extra. You, you really only, you almost get three weeks of recovery if you sit him this week. Because yeah. he's not practicing, you, you know, well, I'm saying if you hold him out of practice, I don't know what, what availability, you know, you would have if, as you try to come back. But then you have next week off as a bye, and then you don't play to the following Saturday. So you really do, like, almost build in, like, three more weeks of recovery by not playing him this week. Yeah, and uh, I think if we get him back, that's be, that'll be huge for Ashton Jensen. Huge. I know people don't typically understand that, but him to take eight to ten carries away from Jensen – would be big. It would be big. It would, and on top of all that too, just getting him off the field. Like mm-hmm. even on plays that aren't designed for Ashton, where he's just in pass pro or something. Get like him get him off the field a few more times a game. He mm-hmm. he played a lot in that second half. And before I I we wrap this up, I wanted to point out one more thing. He um he actually went the wrong way on that carry uh, that Taylor Green scored I did, on. I saw your tweet. Yeah, yeah. He he went the wrong way and he admitted it. And Taylor Green had a little miscue like that down at San Diego where he went the wrong way on a handoff. And now his, uh, his athletic ability saved his buddy. And, t- and, and uh, when Taylor and Ashton got back to the sideline, Ashton was like, thank you, man. You, you saved me. And I love the fact that Ashton owned up to it, said that one was on me. I feel like you wanted to take accountability for that. And I also feel like it's easier to do that when your buddy bails you out and scores a touchdown. But, yeah. you know, that, was, that goes back to that Ashton had like a 68-yard run. He didn't go to the bench. He stayed in the game. He had another run. He gave him another carry, and they yeah. dialed up another carry. But this time, he went the wrong way, and Ashton goes out the or uh, yeah. Taylor goes out the back door and, and saves him. So, we'll see if Boise State can continue to keep it rolling. That is, believe it or not, three wins in the last four games. We'll see if they can make it two in a row this week in Fort Collins. Shane, as always, I appreciate it. No problem. All right, this is Jay Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community. <laughs>